In their book, Calling Bullshit, authors Carl Bergstrom and Jevin West quote sociologist of science Bruno Latour. Latour has argued that scientific claims are typically built upon the output of metaphorical black boxes, which are difficult if not impossible for the reader to penetrate. These black boxes often involve the use of specialised and often expensive equipment and techniques that are time consuming and unavailable or are so broadly accepted that to question them represents a sort of scientific heresy. Many people seem to be convinced that they have seen pictures of viruses in electron micrograph images that have been presented to them. However, this looks like one of Latour's black boxes, and today I'm going to crack it open to expose why these images are not the evidence for viruses, as has been widely claimed. The definition of a virus is crucial, but so frequently overlooked it is astounding. You cannot declare that you have evidence of a virus by observing a sick person, noticing that several people in what appears to be a cluster get similar symptoms, or performing genetic amplification techniques such as the PCR. You will notice in the opening quote that the definition of a virus includes the words intracellular parasites. This means that a virus must be a particle that acts as a parasite, hijacking a host, such as a human, and using their cells to replicate, with these new virus particles then able to potentially infect another host. And if they are parasites, that means that they are pathogenic particles, that is, they cause a disease in the host. When the virus theory was taught to me in medical school, I believed it because I thought that sound scientific experiments must have been completed to back the theory. It wasn't until later that, at the suggestion of others, I investigated the literature for myself and found major problems due to gaps in the evidence. It became clearer that much of what was being presented as evidence was simply information being potentially misinterpreted in order to fit the theory. Static images are something that can easily be misinterpreted after we assign meaning to them that may in fact be disconnected from nature and reality. And this is where the problem of electron micrographs of what are said to be viruses needs to be explored. During my training I would read up on a disease such as measles and somewhere in the chapter of a book would be an image of what was said to be the measles virus. But what had been done to show that this snapshot of some particles had confirmed that they were viruses that could cause this disease? Was the alleged criminal really the cause of disease because somebody had pointed to it with an incriminating arrow? It kind of reminds me of accusing a person outside a bank of being a bank robber just because they were there. To understand the difficulty of assigning meaning to photographs, we can use an analogy involving house fires. If we were only ever shown photographs of firemen standing around smoking piles of ashes, then it could be concluded that they were the cause of the fires, or even that fires were the cause of firemen. The firemen all seem to be comparable sizes with similar external appearances. Perhaps differences in their uniforms could be due to different strains of firemen. Sometimes there are images showing house fire epidemics that engulf whole neighbourhoods, and once again we see firemen everywhere. What on earth is going on here? Now of course all this seems silly to us because we know that house fires are caused by other things that can be easily replicated with experiments. We also have real-time accounts and video footage that clearly shows the temporal pattern where firemen turn up only after the house is on fire and are there to suppress the flames and stop it spreading further. Only once we know all of this can we put static images of house ashes and firemen into the right context. So when someone shows you an image purporting to show a virus, how do you know this is the case? In this situation the electron micrographs are static images which show various nanoparticles in and around cells. Electron micrographs are photographs of stuff that has been embedded in resin and then cut into very thin slices. Whatever is visualised in these images is dead. 
their particles certainly don't replicate and evidence for that must be sought elsewhere. Thus only if there was past proof of replication and the particles have unique characteristics should anyone have any grounds to suggest the virus label. But as we'll see, that is not the case. In this 2021 paper from the CDC, the authors state that investigators have inaccurately reported subcellular structures including coated vesicles, multivesicular bodies and vesiculating rough endoplasmic reticulum as coronavirus particles. They go on to say that we describe morphologic features of coronavirus that distinguish it from subcellular structures. In addition, although the characteristic spikes of coronaviruses may be visible on the virus surface, especially on extracellular particles, they are less evident in thin sections than in negative stain preparations. Keep in mind that the lead author is a specialist in electron microscopy, which is an important consideration as we're about to discover. They are saying that to identify a virus, you need to know exactly what to look for in a structural sense. That would be a reasonable statement if it was already established that they knew exactly what a virus looks like. But how do these experts know what a virus looks like? At some point in time, somebody must claim that they have identified a new virus. If you haven't already seen it, then please watch my video Unscientific Human Experiments on my Odyssey channel as it covers what was claimed to be the discovery of coronaviruses in the 1960s. Much of the research came from David Tyrell, who was associated with the Common Cold Unit in England. Tyrell sought help from June Almeida to produce electron micrograph images from samples that were said to contain these newly discovered alleged viruses. But as I have outlined previously, neither Tyrell nor any of the other virologists purified their nanoparticles and subsequently demonstrated that they were actually viruses. That is, parasitic particles and additionally, as they claimed, were the cause of respiratory diseases. They took samples from patients who were said to have viral infections and then performed various tissue culture experiments in test tubes. Based on their reactions they observed, they declared they had isolated various viruses in their test tubes. But as we know, this does not mean they physically separated the particles so that they could work out exactly what they were made of and perform controlled scientific clinical experiments. Although unlike many of the virology papers today, at least the method section is front and centre in Tyrell and Almeida's 1967 publication, Reading the method section, we see they claim to inoculate respiratory tract cells from what they described as human embryos. Although at 14 to 24 weeks gestation, they are more than embryos and should be called aborted fetuses. Perhaps again, we can see the trend of them being very loose with their terminology. In any case, they report that the cultures were inoculated by dropping 0.2 mils of virus suspension onto the tissue. So here is another sleight of hand. Tyrell has one of his unpurified tissue culture samples that he has declared to contain the virus and mixes it with another tissue culture. After six days, the tissue samples were prepared for electron microscopy. At this point, they ask us to make several leaps of faith. They obtained these images of their second uncharacterized strain B814, which cannot at present be grown in tissue cultures. So they cannot grow the virus, but mixing a biological soup asserted to contain the virus with some more biological soup and stressing the cells of the super soup in the test tube results in some nanoparticles which are declared to be the virus. The results section is where we really see their magic show bloom. They open with virus particles or viral components were detected in almost all the cultures inoculated with known viruses. Hold up, suspected viruses in their pre-imaged mixed brews are now known viruses and this is known because they are viruses. Well, I guess I just assumed. They continue with, and in no instance, in an uninoculated control. An additional control was provided by examining cultures that had been inoculated with herpes simplex and vaccinia viruses and then not incubated but held at 4 degrees. No virus particles were seen in these preparations. Wow, this is some wacky science. Firstly, they don't detail what the uninoculated control experiment involved. 
Secondly, the additional control with their alleged herpes and vaccinia viruses was simply put in a refrigerator instead of incubated at 33 degrees and passaged like the other samples. However, it seems that you can declare you've got a virus in your sample if you see something and if you don't see something. Once the V word appears, there's no stopping them. As they say that two human respiratory viruses, 229E and B814, are morphologically identical with avian infectious bronchitis. Their biological properties, as far as they are known, are consistent with this. So now they are declaring that these are viruses based on the premise that they look like avian infectious bronchitis virus, another particle type that has been declared to be a virus despite never being properly isolated either. And when they say biological properties of these particles, they have failed to demonstrate the most important property of all. At no stage did anyone demonstrate that they were parasitic in nature and can make people or animals sick. In other words, they are simply cellular vesicles of unknown significance. <coughs> yeah, we share the same affliction. But the samples wouldn't simply be known as 229E and B814 for long, as along with avian infectious bronchitis virus, the following year Nature magazine declared that Tyrell and Almeida had apparently discovered coronaviruses, and that's how they came to be. So from that time on, similar looking cellular vesicles of unknown significance were claimed to be coronaviruses, even though no one has ever done the crucial groundwork, that is, purifying the particles and then showing them to be parasitic in nature. At this point, I would like to give a shout out to Mike Stone, who has published many articles on his Virology website. Mike has also discussed the invention of coronaviruses, including an article that covers the electron micrographs. In this, he points out the fallacies concerning alleged virus antibodies and how they were used to label the particles in the 1967 electron micrographs. There's plenty of great material on his website, so check it out, and you can also sign up to his blog so you don't miss out on the latest updates. Dr. Tom Cowan also mentioned Mike in a recent video that dealt with the myths surrounding electron micrograph images, and I'll put a link for Tom's video in the description. Now, back to the CDC paper, Difficulties in Differentiating Coronaviruses, and under the section Coronavirus Structure, they say that knowledge of coronavirus ultrastructure and morphogenesis is paramount to avoiding errors in identification. The name coronavirus was coined by June D. Almeida, who visualized the virus by electron micrograph in 1967. The name was derived from the surface peplomeres or spikes that give the viral particles the appearance of having a solar corona. So that's it. The whole basis to what coronaviruses were supposed to look like forevermore came from Almeida's 1967 images, setting the standard for others to follow. Can you see the problem here? Almeida never demonstrated that the particles she imaged with her electron microscopy were viruses. David Tyrell and others simply brought their biological soups to her and said, there must be viruses in there, so all you need to do is image them. She took this at face value and decided that some of the vesicles she observed must be the viruses. Back to the CDC paper, which goes on to say that the virus is coated with a stain which penetrates between spikes protruding on the virus surface, making them visible. Thus, negative stain electron micrograph images readily show the prominent spikes that are associated with coronaviruses. But once again, this goes into circular reasoning. They are describing techniques to make certain vesicles look more prominent. Vesicles that look like the ones Almeida described, that has nothing to do with establishing what the imaged vesicles do. It is simply a labeling technique. The circular reasoning continues when they say, the difference in the appearance of the virus in negative stain versus thin section contributes to the confusion and misidentification of coronaviruses. This is smoke and mirrors. Don't get me wrong, I'm not claiming that the authors are intentionally doing this, but have they actually read the papers from the likes of Tyrell and Almeida? None of the particles were demonstrated to fulfill the criteria of a virus, so it is nonsense to subsequently claim which ones are the viruses and which ones are not. It brought a little smile to my face when they said, we recommend consulting with a trained diagnostic electron micrograph professional who has extensive knowledge of viral ultrastructure. 
one should only use the term virus or a more specific term such as coronavirus when the particles in question can be positively identified. However, unfortunately, everyone following Almeida's arbitrary declaration of the first imaged coronavirus is simply building on an unestablished premise. It is like being an expert in Harry Potter literature. It doesn't matter how accurately the story is repeated, it's still not real. You have risked the exposure of our world. Thus, the irony of one of their concluding comments that these misinterpretations are easy to make without extensive training and are made easier by the publication of incorrectly identified viral structures. I would suggest that the authors go back to Almeida's paper to see the foundations for this house of cards. The misinterpretation started with the 1967 images. It doesn't matter if any of these apparent experts think a particle looks like a virus. Even they admit that many particles do. What we need to see is a demonstration that the particle is an intracellular parasite and the cause of disease, if that has been claimed. Otherwise, these particles can only be said to be vesicles, like all the other ones related to various cell functions. Recently, I was sent some publications by a friend who remembers the time when at least some of the virologists were trying to stick to very strict methodologies in their hunt for viruses. The authors include virology heavyweights such as Francoise barre senussi and this criteria was suggested in 1973. Although it relates specifically to purported retroviruses with minor modifications, it is still an experimental gold standard of how to identify any postulated virus. If only they'd stuck to this kind of scientific rigor. In any case, it can be summarized as follows. 1. Culture of putatively infected tissue. 2. Purification of specimens by density gradient ultracentrifugation. 3. Electron micrographs of particles exhibiting the morphological characteristics and dimensions, 100 to 120 nanometers of retroviral particles at the sucrose or per cold density of 1.16 grams per mil, and containing nothing else with no apparent differences in physical appearances. 4. Proof that the particles contain reverse transcriptase, only for retroviruses. 5. Analysis of the particles, proteins, and RNA or DNA, and proof that these are unique. 6. Proof that 1 to 5 are a property only of putatively infected tissues and cannot be induced in control cultures. These are identical cultures, that is, tissues obtained from matched unhealthy subjects and cultured under identical conditions, differing only in that they are not putatively infected with a retrovirus. 7. Proof that the particles are infectious, that is, when pure particles are introduced into an uninfected culture or animal, the identical particle is obtained as shown by repeating steps 1 to 5. As I have highlighted, if it is to be claimed that a virus has been discovered, the electron micrograph images are not sufficient unless they demonstrate completely purified particles that can then be tested. Something like this seems to be a joke when they describe it as purified. Something like this image is getting there, but then these particles need to be unequivocally shown to be infectious with appropriate experiments. And to clarify, infectious means replication competent, transmissible, and capable of producing infection in a host, no less. If they could demonstrate these key properties, then they would be able to claim that they had a virus. June Almeida wasn't even close to fulfilling the criteria when it was announced to the world that she had found a coronavirus in her pictures. But 55 years later, these particles are being mislabeled as coronaviruses more than ever before, and not just by some people, as the so-called experts might claim, but by all of them. To help sustain my channel in this time of censorship, please support my work on Subscribestar. Link is in the description. So that we don't lose touch, please find me at drsambailey.com and sign up for my free newsletter.